We are now starting with the final session before lunch today. And um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Humberto, no, Dunley and Carlos, um, who will be presenting in this session. Um, I just wanted to say one thing by way of, of preface, which is that on the website for Cause Economy, Society and Public Policy, ESPP, um, the opening paragraph is... Every democracy needs voters who are fluent in the language of economics and who can do some quantitative analysis of social policy. We also need a well-trained cadre of researchers and journalists who have more advanced skills in these fields. And I would add to that, politicians. Um, never has this statement been more appropriate. Um, and I will now hand over to Humberto, who's going to lead. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so it's... So it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I want to thank uh, the opportunity to come for the second time to this workshop about core. Uh, so, when, so the, the, the idea of this, uh, of this session is to present hmm, Unit 3 of this new ESPP. Hmm? So I hope everything is better than this display, huh? because moving from Mac to, to PC is not always a smooth. Uh, and and the, how to define hmm, the type of presentation I want, I want to give, it's difficult because it's not a lecture for students, huh? so we all know, I think, the topics. It's not the slides that I think should be used huh, for, the, for, the, for the presentation. I would say it's more like a personal view hmm, of how I see this, uh, this chapter in particular and what are the topics and to get, I think, a broad idea with mm, some personal remarks, right? and depending on how much time I have, I tend to be uh, a little bit over-optimistic with time, mm, so I will mm, get more in detail or, or not. So, uh, okay, not a good beginning. So this thing. First, mm, so this is chapter three, so we need to know uh, where we are in the course. So we have, uh, so students in a way, uh, they already have some background, and what they know, it's they have learned about reduced form games, they have learned about the concept of Nash equilibrium. They have played a particular, his, a particular story behind the prisoner's dilemma that it's the pesticide game. And they know what's the problem with social dilemmas and what happens when, rather than being uh, an individual decision maker, we are in a society and we have to get together and we may end up with uh, outcomes that are not uh, the outcomes that, that we want. So once we are here, the way I like to start it's rather than say anything, hmm, so let's go and let's play a game, uh, and that's related uh, to other topics uh, I will be talking later. So this is the standard hmm, uh, divide the dollar. Uh, here is divide the 10-pound note uh, game, where uh, ideally, uh, so we have uh, students playing. So where is this moving? No, yet. Uh, so we have students playing the game with hmm, phones. They get a feedback. So there is a proposer. Uh, we all know this type of game. We, there is a proposer. There is a receiver. The proposer has to make a proposal about hmm, how to share these 20, hmm, uh, these 20 pounds between the two. If accepted, hmm, they get the share. If rejected, they get nothing. Hmm? So if you do that in the classroom, hmm, so you can get something like this that is similar to huh? uh, in general, hmm, with the idea that if you make proposals close to equal split, hmm, they get eh, accepted. If you make proposals hmm, very unequal, they get, they get rejected. Okay? Uh, so then, hmm, the idea would be to reflect on what was the way of thinking about these proposals. And one way hmm, is to say, well, what did you think? Eh, what the students thought about uh, what in their mind when they wanted uh, to make an offer. Uh, mm, and the other thing is to, mm, to ask them uh, what went in their mind when they, have, when they decided to reject or they decided to accept. Mm. So usually what comes here is the idea of fairness. Mm. So they have a concept of fairness. Uh, and mm, the standard argument is uh, if it's very unequal, I decide to reject. Mm. Uh, when I make an offer, I take into consideration not my concept of fairness, but that the person who will receive the offer will have a concept of, of, of fairness. Okay? So the outcome of all this is that there are, there are results in this type of games that are undesirable. Hmm? Undesirable, first, huh? Huh? 
because, and that's the most common one, because they are perceived and unfair, but there is also some outcomes that are undesirable because we are wasting resources. So every time there is an offer that is rejected, the 10 pounds get burned, they disappear. And that's not good for, for anyone, okay? So that you can connect it closely and, and you, uh, with uh, these type of experiments done in different societies, and this already comes from the, uh, from the chapter in the book, uh, and say not only, hmm, so what uh, are wasted offers, it's common to everybody, what is fair and unfair, it may depend on society. Hmm? And this is the same game, hmm? exactly the same we just played in, uh, for, with Kenyan farmers and with the students of Emory University. Hmm? So what we see is the pattern is similar, but uh, there is, if you want, a higher concern for, for hmm? equality or for fairness among, uh, among farmers hmm? in Kenya who will offer more uh, uh, equal hmm, divisions, okay? So, uh, if we want to get hmm, more formal about, about these issues, it's the idea, huh? is the idea that uh, we have hmm, the possibility of wasting resources is this concept of Pareto efficiency. Hmm? The concept of uh, fairness, hmm? it's more huh, of an insider view, and sometimes hmm, this uh, uh, wasting resources, this efficiency, and this fairness, sometimes they are in conflict, sometimes they are aligned together, and they go in the same, in the same direction, okay? So what is this chapter about? Hmm? So that's kind of the, the introduction to say, what is this chapter about? Well, it's about hmm, how we can classify hmm, allocations or outcomes in terms of efficiency, in terms of fairness, and because this is a book that it's directed to policy uh, implementation, well, how to uh, implement policies to achieve these goals and how to find out whether these policies will work or not, okay? So, if we, hmm, so we enter uh, in each one of these, of these four topics, so the first one would be uh, the definition of what is an outcome, what is an allocation, and the concepts of hmm, Pareto. Mm, efficiency. Yeah, I'm not going to enter into, into the, the details. Yeah, what is important is to remark the idea of, of feasibility. Mm, that usually uh, it's not uh, emphasized, at least that's my view, it's not emphasized, emphasized enough. Mm. Uh, it's good, uh, and that's my personal experience, we think of Pareto efficiency as something very obvious. Mm. It's, we've been, uh, we use it all the time. Uh, I explain it, and explain it, I explain this thing to very smart uh, students, and mm, at least mm, the first reaction, then you ask them mm, to consider, and this comes from the pesticide game, so it's a, uh, it's a, it's a prisoner's dilemma type of game, and then you ask them, uh, and I ask them with, uh, with the phones uh, that they have to reply, what allocations are Pareto dominated and qual which ones are Pareto efficient, and they don't get it right. Mm? Not everybody gets it right. Mm? I would say even very smart students, it takes a little bit of time to assimilate the concept of Pareto efficiency that I think for, the, for most of us, this, it seems like, like, a natural, like a natural concept, okay? Uh, the next question is, well, is Pareto efficient or the Pareto criterion useful? Hmm? And then you would say, well, what about if we only had these two options? Hmm? If we only had these two options, then they are not comparable. Hmm? In terms of Pareto efficiency, we cannot say anything about it huh? because uh, in this one, hmm, so if we move from, uh, from 4, 1 hmm, to 2, 2, then what half is someone uh, it's better off, the other is worse off. And what is interesting, and I think it's very, uh, I like a lot on, on the approach of this, of this chapter, is rather than talking about uh, what traditionally has been understood as the you know, hypothetical compensations and so on, uh, never really understood the idea of hypothetical there, it's, it's not really hypothetical, there is a way to, to do compensations. How can we make compensations? Actually, we can create, uh, governments can create new allocations. How? Well, by uh, first creating, putting a tax, and then giving a transfer. Uh, and then we can create a new allocation that is 2525 that mm, it's the one that reveals that this one is not Pareto, mm, 
is not Pareto efficient. Okay? So the role of government and the view of government, and in particular of tax or transfers, as a way of creating new allocations that didn't exist in the first, in the first place, hmm, I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, uh, perspective here. Uh, the example that is in the book uh, in regarding tariffs, one example that I like huh, that could be related to this, and I think it could be nice to, to have, it's, it's related to, to, to climate change, and for example, what happens with coal miners and all the idea of phasing out uh, uh, phasing out uh, uh, coal, hmm? which in, if from the perspective of pure uh, Pareto, uh, Pareto criterion, it's impossible to compare hmm? a situation in which you have coal miners uh, getting, uh, uh, losing their, their jobs. Hmm? However, there are ways in which if you think about tax and transfer, there are ways where they can be, uh, we, they can all end up being better. Uh, so next thing, hmm, next topic is furnace. So we talk about efficiency, next topic is furnace. Hmm? And to talk about furnace, uh, the example that it's very, actually the study that it's very interesting is a study that says, let's ask about what's the fair distribution of wealth hmm, uh, in the US. Hmm? And you can ask what's the uh, ideal distribution. Hmm? Let's put it this way. Hmm? What is the notion of furnace that people have? Okay, and that's mm, what we think it should be eh, a fair distribution of, uh, of, uh, of wealth. And we see that it may change. Mm, so this is the average. It may change depending on what's our personal or, or their personal position. A different thing is what is our perception mm, of what's the, uh, the actual distribution, mm, whether it's fair or unfair. And the third point is what's, what's the reality. Mm? And what we see is that they, mm, none of them coincide. So, and this tend to be, tend to be the case. So we uh, have a concept of fairness uh, that, it's, mm, uh, uh, that implies that the reality is very unfair, but actually the perception of our reality, mm, of what's the, the actual, the actual uh, distribution of wealth, is that it's less unequal than it actually, it actually is. Uh, however, mm, and that's, eh? so this is not in the book, I think it, it could be interesting to say, what we think it should be fair doesn't make hmm, an outcome to be fair. Hmm? And I think the example I like is it's slavery. Hmm? There was a period in time where if you ask people, is slavery fair or, or it's just hmm? or it's right, if you want to put it this way, no, a majority of people who had a boy, eh? if slaves were excluded, so they accepted it, but this didn't make slavery eh? right. So how can we uh, get a concept of what is fair? Well, ideally, is we would like to remove our personal interests. Hmm? And that could be, so this is why we may have different concepts of fairness, because depending on our position, we have uh, a different uh, in personal interest. And this is the, hmm, if you want the excuse, in order to introduce the idea hmm, of roles, uh, bail of ignorance. Hmm? And roles based of ignorance, what introduced is, is, is to say, if I want to, hmm, so one <coughs> way to remove our personal interest is try to make a decision of what is fair and what is unfair without knowing who I will be in society. Okay, so I put myself behind a bell of ignorance that doesn't reveal hmm, what will be my outcome and I have to decide, if you think about the distribution of wealth, I have to decide what's the distribution of wealth without knowing whether I will be in this group or I will be in this group, hmm? if you want to think uh, in particular here. Now, uh, the, next, hmm, the next thing is what uh, qualification should be. Huh? So what could, be, what could make an allocation unfair? Hmm? And here, uh, I'm going to be I'm like running a little bit out of time. So here, the two concepts, uh, it's substantive or procedural uh, unfairness, hmm? with the idea that substantive have to compare only outcomes. Procedural is how we end up reaching, reaching these outcomes, okay? Uh, and elements for the procedural judgment, hmm? it could be more in the nosic type of conception of, of fairness, uh, with the idea that if hmm, we obtain things in a legitimate way and there is voluntary exchange, that could create fairness, idea of equality of opportunity, or even deservedness. Okay? Uh, how do we connect this with the, with the public sector? 
Well, if an allocation is inefficient or unfair, if it's not desirable, then there is room for government intervention. Uh, and governments can either uh, intervene by prohibiting or giving directives, creating incentives, mostly taxes, subsidies, or making information uh, available. Okay? Uh, what is important, I think, and this is the key contribution of this section in the, in the book, is that mm, when implementing policies, governments need to take into account that economic agents may change their choices because of the policy, and they may change their preferences because of the policy. Uh, regarding changing their, their choices, so the example, hmm, it's a kind of wrong side of the Laffer curve uh, example, where hmm, the idea is whether we have a high tax or a moderate tax, and with the high tax creates an incentive hmm, for firms in order to hmm, invest in lawyers who could exploit the loopholes of the tax and avoid this tax, and that's not profitable if you have a moderate tax. Hmm? So if the objective were only to increase uh, to increase revenue, of course, the idea mm, is to have, uh, uh, in principle, you may think about having a high tax rate, but if you take into consideration these changes in, in the choices of, of agents, what you end up is that the only equilibrium, so what government should expect, is that if you put a high tax, mm, owners will decide to, mm, to invest a lot in, in, in loop costs. Okay. Now, with respect to changes in preferences, hmm, I think this is a well-known example, but, I, but it represents really nice the, 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 un, the unintended consequences of policies. So this is the case of Israel, where they put a fine on uh, lateness hmm, to pick up your children from a school. Hmm, and what happened is that, uh, so before there were hmm, parents who were not uh, picking up their kids in school, you put a fine, and by setting a fine, what actually is you put a price hmm, to this commodity that before had a social, a social value. So you crowd out these social preferences for this now hmm, economic of price preferences, in, inducing an unintended consequence that now more huh, uh, parents end up uh, arriving late to pick up their kids. And moreover, that actually Mm? You change mm, the effects mm, that in principle were just in personal preferences. You end up changing social preferences. And even when you remove, mm, or when they remove the fine, mm, it still persists this, this effect on the, on the policy. Okay? You yes. You yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, don't have, mm, I lo I, if I have my wallet there, I'll get it. Uh, so, in three, uh, three minutes, I think it's, I think it's fine. Huh? So, it's, uh, so the last, hmm, and this is the last point of the, of the chapter, is to try to explain how can we find whether a policy hmm, will work or not. Now that we know how, uh, what are the objectives of policies and what we want the policies to, or what we should take into consideration, uh, how to find, hmm, find out if policy will work? Well, it depends. Hmm, on, uh, and this should come, uh, so it's, it's, it's changed, it should come from the word work. Right? What does it mean to work? So it depends on the objective. If the objective, uh, so if the policy to work is to get the highest revenue, then what you want is price inelastic demands. And I think this is a good opportunity to raise the trade-off between efficiency and inequality uh, that for me, huh, and, uh, so I was thinking to do this at the end, but I'm not going to have uh, time. I think this is one of the issues that it may, uh, it may uh, or you could receive more emphasis in, the, in, in this chapter. Okay? So uh, the example that it's used, the classical example, is a salt, you know, a salt tax, hmm? where we have a very inelastic, and it's an easy way to, to get revenue. Now, if the objective is to change behavior, then what we should know is to hmm, choose price elastic demands. And the example is through sugar tax. And uh, they, are good, hmm? they are also a good opportunity to introduce some kind of mini debate between the students regarding hmm, the idea of carbon tax, because carbon tax has this issue that you want to change behavior, but uh, actually you are affecting demands that are highly inelastic. Hmm? And if you want to connect it with inequality, it's also hmm, 
uh, 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 tags that unless you introduce other type of policies, it may create uh, issues of inequality. Now, the third objective is that maybe you want to hmm, do something that it's neither high uh, change behavior or increased revenue that could be to promote invention. And here, what we all, uh, what always comes to mind is the idea of property rights and patents. So how do we know if property rights and patents will make, uh, will play the role? Uh? So the argument, and this is, uh, it's to use history and natural experiments to establish causality beyond uh, correlation. So it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to introduce the idea of, mm, of natural experiments. Uh, there are mm, many examples in the chapter, and it's not that, uh, so, uh, so I don't have time to go through, through the details. So in summary, mm, the summary of the chapter, I think, are three points. So first, governments may want to intervene if outcomes are not desirable because of inefficiency or because unfairness. Uh, governments must consider that policies may change agents uh, choices and preferences. And second, governments could use the data to estimate the impact of policies or to find evidence in natural experiments in order to determine beforehand whether the, the policies will, will affect or not. Okay? So uh, I don't have a lot of time. Let me just make a couple of, of comments. So if uh, my personal view of the chapter, so this is a chapter I really like. Uh, so I think it's a fantastic uh, a chapter that introduces hmm, so I, it has not been, eh? it has been very far from being exhaustive on examples and applications that are explained in the chapter. Uh, the two things I would say, eh? so, to, to, so not to be eh, too uh, positive on all the, all the remarks. So the two issues that I think it, I would like to see more prominent in this, in this chapter, one is, is the conflict between efficiency and, and equity. And the second is the role of, of equality of opportunity. Hmm? But this I, I may have a, a personal bias. Hmm? So because usually when I ask no, who's against equality of opportunity, hmm? so I ask this in every class I teach, I've never seen a, a, a hand being raised uh, against equality of opportunity. And here equality of opportunity is kind of hidden. Hmm? And it gives equality of opportunity the, oppor the, the, the possibility hmm? to combine these two views of, of procedural. Hmm? So and I have some comments about the difference between procedural and uh, so the two concepts of, of fairness, but that's, uh, I, will, I will leave it here because I, I already went over time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Duny Li. I'm the uh, teaching fellow at the Department of, of Economics at UCL. So today I will briefly share my experience uh, of using the ESPP Economy Society and Public Policy. So first, Oh, there's some technical problem. The clicker is going to work. Oh, thank you. Uh, so first, let me briefly explain the module I'm teaching. So it's, uh, it's called an introduction to applied economics. So this module is, a, is an uh, optional module basically available to all the students as long as they are not economic students. <laughs> so this is non-economy students from the other department. So later I will show you some evidence, some statistics to show basically where uh, they are from. Um, so, and then also uh, in terms of uh, time dimension or year dimension, so the students from the year one to three, they are all, they are all able to, to choose the module. And um, in this year 2018 to 19, so basically the latest one is 41 students enrolled this course. And then for this course, I adopted both the ESPP and the doing economics. And uh, the, it's, uh, it's only one term module, so we only have basically 10 lectures and uh, four tutorials for the uh, contact hours. So in terms of this uh, reading for the lectures, so we use the, the, the ESPP, of course, so students are expected to read the books, the book unit, and in addition, also provide some additional readings, including, the, for example, some articles from New York Times or these uh, uh, videos. This is actually also produced by CORE. From the CORE, this um, resources, how to find best response, for example, for the lecture two. And at the very beginning, the students, basically, they are given this uh, course planner, basically, to kind of manage the expectation that what they expect to do over the entire term. So, um, so for each week, they are given some tasks, so including do this uh, MC MCQ. Actually, the students really appreciate the MCQ and also uh, have some this homework, this assignment. So this, home assi this homework uh, basically is the, the questions are the mixture of the Excel questions and the essay type questions. 
in particular, uh, I would like to introduce this, uh, what we call the self-evaluation survey, because eventually I will, in, when I talk about challenge, basically we'll see this challenge has been revealed by the student's response to the self-evaluation survey. So this self-evaluation survey is basically compulsory for students to complete. So before they submit the assignment, they need to reflect on the uh, coursework. In, uh, uh, specifically, we have three questions to ask them to reflect on what aspect or assignment they think they're doing well, which aspect they find particularly challenging, and then based on the, this uh, based on the great descriptor, what uh, uh, scores they expect to receive. And overall, so overall that the students actually, overall the students, um, they like a lot about the, the book. They can see the especially like the format of the book, which is interactive, they can see it's fun to read. And in terms of course material, they also find it's uh, very interesting, it's very useful, and basically they, they appreciate the, the, the provision of, of, of this module. So this is our overall experience, quite positive. And then given this um, diverse this uh, student background, as you can see that the students indeed have this mixed view on the difficulty of the coursework, which has been revealed in this uh, self-evaluation survey. So you can see that I, here I show two examples, basic assignment one, which is a mixture, basic assignment. The question is a mixture of the Excel question and the, uh, and the, the S type question, and assignment four, basic all S type questions. So you can see this as an example, you can see for the same this assignment, different student, they indeed, you can see basically they, they, they the, uh, according to the self-evaluation survey, they indeed have different this of views on the difficulty of the coursework. For example, for the assignment one, some students consider that it is they are doing relatively well in terms of interpretation of data. However, they find it extremely challenging to use Excel because this is becomes new to them. On the other hand, some students have feel very confident using Excel to create graphs. However, they find it difficult basically to explain the ideas. So this just gave you an example to see the contrast of view of the students given this uh, different background. Similarly to for the assignment four, so basically the students asked to draw diagrams and then they analyze it, uh, if there's a shock, exogenous shock, how this uh, diagram is curved, how it will move, how the equilibrium will change, this uh, type of questions. So some students find it is easy to draw a diagram, but it's hard to evaluating the, basically the consequence of the different shocks. However, some other students, they, they consider that it is very challenging to, to sketch a diagram. However, in terms of narrative, it's relatively easier for them. So this just gave you some evidence saying that how students perceive this, uh, uh, the coursework. So basically from, from what I learned, basically from what I learned from this, uh, from this presentation, next I would like to have some uh, brief discussion, basically regarding because we have many folks on the challenge of using core to basically to teach. So now the question is that I would like to seek some advice or suggestion from the, uh, the participant that do you have uh, any experience with using core basically to teach non-economic students from different department? So if, yet, if, if your answer is yes, then how do you cope with this different background of students? And if, if, if your answer is no, then what do you think this situation can be dealt with? Yeah, this basically is a question um, for, for discussion. At this point, I do not find, um, uh, actually I don't have this, I don't have answers, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm, okay. Um, I guess, due to, I think only uh, 13 minutes left, probably we leave at the end, end, end of the session, if time permits, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sunday, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Carlos. I come from the University of Exeter. I volunteer to introduce CORE in my department. You might think I'm, I'm quite mad. Um, and the reason is because I was involved in, in helping develop some, some of the, the results. But my main motivation was this. We teach economic principles to non-specialists, so economics majors, and they were really, really difficult module to teach. These kind of comments used to break my heart. I mean, what Tara said earlier really resonates with me. They used to love economics, then they come to university and they hate it. Um, there were about 50% of students at economics A level, and basically economic principles was a repetition of economics A level. So half the class was really struggling, half the class was really, really bored. In fact, the word cloud of student um, evaluation at the end, the biggest word was bored. Okay, so that's, that was my, my motivation there. So uh, my class was 
465 students from eight different programs, so diverse background as, as it was mentioned. Economic majors continue in the, in the traditional course, but because, because the sky didn't fall, we're actually introducing the economy uh, from September to everybody. So there's an equal number of students of economic majors. When I started, I was thinking, well, because the core is free and is available to everybody, what are we going to teach in the lectures? Are we just going to repeat what the students say? I actually thought maybe we can get rid of the lectures. <coughs> and I started looking about the literature. What does the literature say about that? I mean, I know Robbie did that, not by choice, but he had to do it. Uh, and I have, we have a colleague from Guillermo who's going to be here tomorrow who actually got rid of the lectures. Okay, so in Queen Mary, they decided to go that way. I didn't. I, I kept the lectures for two reasons. One, because the quality assurance needs two years' notice when we make changes to timetable, so I couldn't make that change. But also because there's some evidence that partial flip learning bears better results than full flip learning. And also, I've got a lot of students, even with this, who kept saying, well, a couple of few students, I pay £9,250 and I have to do all the work. I mean, how's the fairness in that? So. Um, so I looked at the literature a little bit about, about the, the flip teaching approach where students do most of the work at home and then come to the lecture for discussion. And basically, there is, the evidence shows there's not much difference between flip teaching and, uh, and traditional teaching. Most literatures show some gains, but they are fairly small. And there's very, very few reports saying that, that they do worse. So in, in a sense... There's nothing to lose by doing this approach. That was my, my point of view. The main benefits that were reported in literature is in terms of student engagement. They, a lot of students report increasing attendance. And I thought that's something that we're all struggling with. Students don't come to lectures, so I thought this was a good uh, do. Whether students engage with the pre-reading and all the, 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 all the activities we set for them really depends how the, the rules of the game, basically, if it counts as summative assessment or not, if it's compulsory or not, that has a massive impact. And, and has this, uh, so setting the rules of the game, it's a really important thing. So, also about student preferences. I was interested in that, okay? Flip learning, uh, students' perceptions are mixed. And I think this already was mentioned several times here. Overall positive, but there are big extremes here. Most students seem to like it after it's been implemented a while. So the first year seems to be uh, a lot of students struggle with it. And that's precisely what I, what I see. They do, the, the things they like the most about flip learning is the increased group work, the more interactive uh, activities that you have in the lecture, and also because they own the, the learning process. So they actually take charge of that. Instead of sitting and taking notes, they have to do a lot of work themselves. But, and there's always a but, isn't there? Students often have very negative views in the first year. So if you are... <coughs> thinking about this, I'm not saying this is something that's definitely going to happen, but it's something you should be aware. And your head of department should be aware as well when you get the student satisfaction scores that might go down the first year. Okay, So this is more or less normal. Okay, And some students <laughs> have very persistent negative views about this. And it's partly the £9,250 that they are paying, they expect everything to be done for them, and it's mostly the students with economics A-level, which have their expectations also a little bit taught. Where is demand and supply? Okay. I get that comment uh, quite a lot. So how did I decide to implement it? So I kept the lectures, two weekly lectures. Um, I didn't actually teach core during those lectures because students had to do all the reading of the units before the lecture. Okay, so I didn't have to go slide after slide about all the content because students had to do that learning before. We had fortnightly tutorials, long story. It's not my choice, but we have very stretched in terms of resources at Exeter, so that's all I could have. Um, and then 
I indeed implement the rules of the game to encourage students to engage. So on average, students had to do two homeworks a week. And this was before the lecture. And this was part of the summative assessment. And this was to encourage them to engage, because otherwise lots of students do it, other students don't. I had a final exam where I introduced this multiple choice with uh, multiple correct answers. Again, some students liked it, a lot of them didn't. They were really worried about this. And they also had to do empirical assessments from the doing economics. Now, this was summative assessment, but it was ungraded. And this was also a novelty. So even if a student gets 80%, they will fail if they don't complete the doing economics assessment, okay? And this is creating a few headaches among my colleagues. But it worked. So the big majority, over 98%, did all the Excel assignments. So what worked well? Let's start with that. Attendance was consistently higher than previous years, okay? That's something that was really noted. I did teach my, one of the lectures at Monday, 8.30. So that one was less attended from day one, okay? But the attendance was more or less consistent throughout. Um, students were really positive about the textbook and the topics covered, generally. Um, they kind of saw the point of homework and the empirical assignments. And most students did the pre-reading, okay? So when they came to lecture, they knew the concepts already. So I didn't have to teach it at all, okay? So I could focus on activities to develop in the classroom, like running experiments, showing a TED talk, getting a discussion going about a current event, something that was published that morning on BBC or whatever it was. And I did not need to cover everything on the lecture, slide after slide of really basic not very engaging topics. So I could select what I wanted to show and focus on discussion and activities, and I thought that was really positive. This was the grade of the homework marks. Most students did them all, okay? And they did get high grades. So the vast majority got at least 70% on those tasks. If it was formative, that probably would be the opposite way, the distribution, okay? So that's why I decided to do it this way. We are economists, we know people respond to incentives, so I had to create uh, incentives. Um, students reported, self-reported, studying three times more for my module than other modules. This might actually explain some of the better results that you've seen at UCL. I'm not complaining about that. If they are getting better results because they study more, that's a good result for me, okay? So that, I, I don't mind about that. They enjoyed the experiments in class. I used props like tennis balls and lots of uh, experiments, giving chocolates and, and things like that, and students engaged. I did try to run more advanced experiments computer-based, like the incomplete contracts experiment. It didn't work. Some students were really fast, then they were waiting for everybody else. With a class of 465, it's something very difficult to accomplish. Maybe if I had 50, it would work well. With that kind of site, I'm going to drop that. Um, I brought guest speakers, including alumni. I brought alumni who worked for a year at the department of exiting the EU, I think it was called. Because Brexit was one of the big words that came up in my word cloud. And they were fascinated to find out how... <laughs> uh, my friend is out whenever anyone mentions Brexit. Okay. <laughs> how Brexit and the policy-making process. I really enjoyed I had someone coming to talk about Bitcoin and so on and so on. So I really have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't the best results. There were two people out of 465 who said the content was boring. And it was boring because they felt there was too much overlap between the lectures and the book. I didn't think that was, but they did. In previous years, I'm telling you, it were hundreds of comments. So this, for me, was very, very, very positive. And the module was really fun to teach. I taught micro for the first time, OK? I actually found it really, really good. Quite easy, but you know, it was, it was good. 
So, what didn't work so well? Lots. Uh, I did a word cloud of the positive comments and the negative comments, and they were identical. Okay, a lot of people said homeworks were brilliant. A lot of people said homeworks were too much work, and I hate it. And the same thing about pretty much every item. So you've got a bimodal distribution about some of these topics. You can't please everybody. It's, it's, it's the, 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 the... Some students with A-level economics really didn't like core, precisely because we don't have all the supply and demand and everything they're expecting. So suddenly, some of them actually mentioned one of the units that is covered really well in high school is about market failures around climate change and, and all that. They cover that really well in high school, so they felt that unit wasn't really useful to them. I had a problem with some of the teaching assistants. We're going to pick it up uh, next week. Um, as Tara, I think, said, small group teaching is even more important in core. Okay, so if that part doesn't work well, students will really, really complain. Some students, surprisingly, because this is for non-specialists, actually wanted more maths. There was some maths, there was some algebra, but I kept it to a minimum. But they wanted a bit more, uh, especially accounting students really wanted more, more maths. So, uh, <laughs> okay, one minute, last slide. Most negative comments were the lack of previous resources for them to prepare. As you know, they are obsessed with, with assessment. Um, everybody called for more tutorials. Um, again, some students were surprised me because there was little overlap, but they, they, they wanted more. And too much homework, too much work. I mean, that's something they complained. But most people were quite happy with it. So what's next? That's my plan. I'm going to talk a little bit about this second point tomorrow. Uh, not going to use computer-based. We're going to. I introduced uh, weekly uh, seminars and possibly some computer lab sessions. And we are introducing the economy for economic majors from September. And I'll stop here. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> We're really tight on time, but I know like it when we don't have an opportunity for Q&A. So can we take two questions? Is that okay, Tom? So let me see. Let us see hands. I see, I see two hands. There's a, oh, and I, I have a mic. Pass it around. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, very interested in the uh, responses and the way you structured Oh, Alan Higgins from University College Dublin, and I'm in a business school, uh, School of Management. So, um, yeah, so really interesting teaching model, the structure you have set up for the module. Um, and I, my question is, with respect to, I think it's something Wendy maybe or Sam mentioned also in the way you've structured it, is that you, you suggested that CORE is giving these uh, neophyte students very naturalistic, intuitive way of understanding, of develop, of using their uh, intuitive knowledge of economics, um, and that this, the tools you're using are kind of like the tools that economists use in the real world. So do the tutorials feed into that in any way, or, or are, are we still breaking our teaching model, uh, so re reinventing the teaching model somewhat? Is there a way of making it more like economists' work environment? Um, yeah, I mean, we're going to talk about this in detail tomorrow, so I'm not going to spend too long. But, I mean, the, the, the small group, class group um, sessions are precisely to make sure students understand what we're going on in the lectures, apply it, but also, more importantly, to work in groups, which is something economists are not really used to doing. So getting a discussion going and making them understand that unlike in A-level economics, there's no unique solutions in a lot of topics that we, we, we cover. So students need to develop their own opinions. They need to, um, especially when we talk about policy making, there's all sorts of possible outcomes. And that's something that A-level economic students are not used to doing. They say, it's in the textbook, it's true. Okay, that's how we do things, pretty much. Um, and the core way is, is more about uh, arguing that there's no, not unique solutions a lot of times, and you know your your, your personal circumstances will affect the results. I, I can't 
trying to imagine that was more apprentice-like and that this sort of practice transfer will taking place in that more intimate session, but maybe tomorrow. Yeah. Who else was? Can I pass the mic? Um, hi. Um, first, I want to thank all of the presenters for fantastic presentations. I really learned a lot. Um, I wonder uh, if, if any of you have any insights about which methods or content uh, appealed differentially to men and women students, because uh, a major project in CORE now is to see if we can be part of addressing the gender imbalance in the field. So have you learned anything, or do you have any hints? I mean, we're, we're trying to do some serious evaluations and so on, but anything you may have learned, I'm thinking about the flipped classroom and so on, uh, would be useful. Um, one of the things I noted with, with the flipped classroom, and I start if that's OK, is that um, male students procrastinate a lot more than female students, and I think that's probably common knowledge, but it became really, really strong. So a lot of male students leave it to the last minute, and then they miss the deadline for submitting an assignment, and then it's the end of the world. Hardly any female student works like that. Okay? Another thing that it's interesting to see, and I did that this year on Unit 3, it, there are different preferences very often about what's fair, what's unfair, um, if you separate the class in genders. And that was visible clearly visible in my class, and that's something I'd like to explore more as well. I don't know, Umberto, if you've got. Does anyone else want to make one contribution in relation to Sam's question, just now from experience you have? There's plenty of time over these next 24 hours or so for us to pursue that under the discussion. So let's close this session. Thank okay. you for all the presenters. Thank you for everyone. Thank you.